This is one of the many TV commentary boxes for all the television commentators who are covering tonight's Eurovision. It's estimated that the total television audience for this year's Eurovision will be over 500 million people. Amongst those commentators, there's Terry Wogan and our own Larry Gogan. And their names and the names of some of the other members of the Irish delegation are causing quite a lot of confusion. As well as Wogan and Gogan, there's of course Johnny Logan, and there's here an RTE designer called Michael Grogan and a musician called Hogan. So that's Wogan, Gogan, Logan, Grogan and Hogan. Terry, you heard Johnny Logan's song this afternoon. Uh, how do you rate the performance? Well, I, I rate his performances very well. I mean, I'm, I, what surprised me was after it happened for him in 1980 that he didn't become a huge international star because he's all the necessary equipment. He's handsome, he's a good singer, very good singer. And I'm amazed that he didn't become a really big star. But this could be it this time. I mean, I think he must have a very good chance of winning. The only thing that will militate against him would be the fact that he has won it in the past. But it must be the best song, and I think he's certainly among the best performers. So um, no, I wouldn't mind a little bet. What does winning the Eurovision mean to uh, an artist nowadays? Well, it used to mean a great deal more than it does now. I don't think... Uh, Certainly Britain and Ireland don't have quite the same interest in the Eurovision that they used to. It used to be whatever won the Eurovision immediately went to number one in the British and Irish charts. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. I think it's, it's, there's demographic reasons for it apart from anything else. People have other things to do on a Saturday night, you know, or they have, they have a video film or they tape something that they look at. So you don't get the same numbers of people watching. In Britain and Ireland, I think all over Europe, it's as important as ever, you know, they, yeah, they do the take it very seriously. Why the Continentals take it so seriously? Well, the music is geared to, to Europe. I mean, Britain and Ireland are sort of trying to gear their music to suit Europe. And I think that's, that's certainly where Britain falls down quite often, is because the jury that selects the song for Europe tends to select something which they think will be a Eurovision song. So they think along, boom, bang, a bang, congratulations, lions, you know. You take a slightly tongue-in-cheek look at Eurovision each year. Oh, yes. It's, a, it's an exercise in, in foolishness, really. I mean, it's just a competition. I mean, criticising it because of, of its lack of musical quality is like pushing against an open door. That's not what it's about. It's the comp competitive element. It's the fun of it. It's the, the foolish costumes. It's the silly performances. It's the, it's the performances that look about ten years out of date, you know. That's, that's what I look for. I mean, it's, it's the fun of it. There are those who are here just for the fun of it, but there are many here besides the performers with a lot at stake. The winning country is expected to host next year's contest, but with a budget of over £4 million this year, that's a daunting prospect for any television station. However, the head of RTE's variety department, Avril McCrory, would welcome the challenge. The mounting of the show here has cost over four million pounds. Can RT afford that kind of money? Well, our colleagues in RTBF um, were not able to meet the bill of four million pounds this year. They are very much like ourselves in a similar sized country uh, and they had to seek sponsorship, which was the first time that that has happened in Eurovision and in fact it took a lot of negotiations to get 22 countries, many of whom have utter bans and, com and complete bans in sponsorship to agree to that. But they did agree to it this year and I think RT at this stage are saying that if uh, Johnny does win and we hope that he does, we will mount the contest very well next year but as to how we raise the finance that is a matter for discussion when we all return to Dublin and that will be announced in future, future weeks. The performance is even better than at the dress rehearsal. As Johnny returns backstage, his fellow performers give him a standing ovation. He's the only singer to get this tribute, a generous admission on the part of his competitors. The Irish delegation is jubilant, emotions are running high, but they're soon back in their chairs for that long, long wait. The voting seems to take forever, the tension is almost unbearable. One look at him and it's clear Johnny doesn't just want to win, he needs to win. The top points are starting to come now and Johnny salutes that country's delegation in gratitude. The voting is close, but all eyes are on Johnny. He's out in front. Someone does a calculation. He can't be caught. Suddenly it's all over. He's won.
It's been a long climb, but Johnny Logan is finally back on the top rung of the showbiz ladder. It's champagne all the way. And why not? It's a fairy tale ending to a story that started seven years ago. Going from rags to riches, back to rags, and now back to riches. A remarkable story that defies description. What can you say when words are not enough?